As usual, I am going to try to cram a lot of information into a short period of time, so stick around today for part two of the spirit and power of Elijah. Uh, I'll be live streaming this to Sermon Audio and also YouTube, and if uh, you enjoy these Bible studies, share them with your friends and family. They'll also be aired on Final Fight Bible Radio at fr on Fridays at 8 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock. Uh, also on Final Fight Bible Radio on our premium stream, we've added a uh, teaching-only stream. So in addition to a music-only stream, a preaching-only stream, a scripture stream, a youth stream, there is now a teaching-only stream. A lot of my Bible studies will be available and be able to be heard on that stream. And for more information, you can go to FinalFightBibleRadio.com to find out about how you can sign up for premium. But uh, also, I wanted to say thank you to my friend Rick, who has all has put almost all of my recorded video material onto Sermon Audio. As a matter of fact, I think he has done 100% of it. So that is a lot of material he's put. There's now, last time I checked, there were 110 different video Bible studies on Sermon Audio. So if you go to SermonAudio.com, you just type in Matt Crane in the search bar, and you can find all of those Bible studies, 110 different Bible studies, and um, you can also download the Sermon Audio app, Sermon Audio 2.0, and you can get notifications anytime there's a new one put on there. So really great resource there. And uh, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2. This is part two of these lessons on the spirit and power of Elijah. And this study involves the exceptional power that Elijah was given and the few times throughout the Bible that this power shows up. And the Bible says here in 2 Kings chapter, uh, just to refresh your memory, I'm going to go ahead and read a portion of it. We'll start in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 8. And the Bible says, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too, that's Elijah and Elisha, went over on dry ground. So they've just passed the Jordan River, and Elijah's getting ready to be taken. And it says here in verse 9, And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah, Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. All right, so last week I showed you that there's no need to speculate as to what a double portion means in the Bible here. Uh, the double portion, if you compare scripture with scripture, it is a term that relates to an inheritance. So essentially, when Eli Elisha asked for the double portion of Elijah's spirit, Elisha, as a son to a father, is saying, hey, I want, can I have an inheritance? He's asking to inherit the spirit of Elijah. And then we looked at what exactly was meant last week by the spirit of Elijah. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean Elijah's human spirit that's in him, the spirit of Elijah? Or does that mean the uh, spirit of God that was on Elijah? Because there's two different spirits of Elijah that you could be referring to, the human spirit of Elijah or the spirit of God that was on Elijah. Which one was it that Elisha wanted? And I showed you last week, un undoubtedly, it was the spirit of God that was on Elijah that Elisha wanted. But a lot of times people make a mistake and want that human spirit that the individual has and tries to mimic personalities and things like that. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the power is not in a man's human spirit. The power is obviously in the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. And Elisha didn't need Elijah's human spirit any more than you need your favorite pastor's human spirit. 
And trying to copy or mimic the personality of some preacher somewhere is a very foolish approach to the ministry. You need to be yourself and be yielded to the Holy Spirit. All right? All right, so finally, last week I mentioned that this passing of the power, which was symbolized by the passing of Elijah's mantle, that was the sign, if you will, uh, was a very unique and exceptional thing that happened there in the Old Testament. That is to say that this power, this Spirit of God, this power that Elijah had that was passed on to Elisha, uh, that power does not pass from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, okay? There is an exceptional transmission that's going on here. When Elisha asked to inherit the Spirit of God from Elijah, Elijah told him, thou hast asked a hard thing. In other words, the imputation of this power from Elijah to Elisha was not normal and it was not natural, okay? So you need to get that. This was an exceptional thing. Recall that Elisha was told that he had to witness Elijah being taken into heaven uh, in order to receive this power, and Elisha verified that he did when he said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Kind of like, I saw it. It was right there. And Elisha said that he saw the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So real quick, I just want to point something out. The horsemen with the chariot that pertains to Israel, this horseman of this chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, who is this? Who is the one driving the chariot? And uh, it's the Lord is the answer. Uh, if you look at Psalms, or Isaiah 66, 15, I've got a bunch of Bible verses here today to go through. So I'm going to just, as soon as I get there, I'm going to read it. Isaiah 66, 15, for behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind. There's the fire, there's the chariots, there's the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. But notice there that the chariots are the Lord's chariots. Uh, Psalms 104, verse 3. The Bible says, Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the water, speaking of God, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. The Bible says in Habakkuk 3, 8, Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea? Speaking of the second advent, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation. So the Lord has a chariot. And uh, actually, Ezekiel describes uh, this, this chariot in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, and it's the mobile throne of the Lord, which has wheels and is conducted by the cherubim and moves at lightning speeds. Ezekiel 1.14 says, And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So, uh, by all indications, uh, this vehicle that picked up Elijah is what Elisha saw. He, he, evidently, he saw the same vehicle that Ezekiel saw. In other words, Elisha caught a glimpse of the Lord. The Lord came down in his chariot. He is the horseman of Israel, and it's his chariot. He came down and picked up Elijah and gave him a personal escort up into heaven. <laughs> and, Elisha, and Elisha saw it. He caught a glimpse of the Lord. And so, again, this is just further to show that what happened here, Elisha catching a glimpse of, of a, the, a theophany, you know, a pre, an Old Testament appearance of God, is a very exceptional and very unique thing. And something uh, that doesn't happen all the time in the Old Testament, and this passing of the power was not uh, something that's just passed on and passed on like it's no big deal. All right? So, and besides, this fact is further demonstrated in 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13, and you can read that story, but when Elisha was dying, the king of Israel, Joash, uh, was there at Elisha's bedside. And King Joash knows that, you know, Elisha's getting ready to die, and this powerful prophet had on more than one occasion, delivered the nation of Israel from their enemies. And so the king of Israel, Joash, uh, he, he realizes that uh, Israel needs Elisha. Like, this is going to be a disaster for this great prophet to be gone and be off the scene. Israel needs this prophet. Israel needs someone like him to help uh, the nation of Israel against their enemies. And evidently, Joash gets the idea that maybe he can be the one to inherit this power. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 13, go ahead and go there. 2 Kings chapter 13, this is the conversation on Elisha's deathbed. Elisha is not getting taken up by a chariot into heaven. He's on his deathbed. And the king of Israel is coming to visit him. And it almost seems like Joash, you know, he's thinking, man, what are we going to do? We need this power of God here in Israel. And he might be thinking, well, 
Maybe I could be the one to inherit this power. Maybe, maybe Elisha could pass the power on to me. And, uh, you know, maybe I could have the mantle next. And so Joash weeps over Elisha, and he says the same thing to Elisha that Elisha had said to Elijah. Look at 2 Kings 13, verse 14. Now, when Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, uh, now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down uh, and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That's the same exact thing that Elisha had said to Elijah when he received his power. All right. So Joash says this to Elisha and nothing happens. <laughs> No mantle for you, Joash. <laughs> it seems like he was thinking that the power was going to pass on to him. Like, hey, Elisha, you're my father, and like I'm your son, so maybe I can inherit the power that you inherited. Kind of like this, it's all in the family. Elijah passed it to you, and you can pass it to me. And so he makes this statement, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. You know, he makes this statement that has zero relevance to Joash. I mean, Joash didn't see the chariot of Israel, Joash didn't see the Lord. <laughs> and so Elisha is probably laying on his bed and he kind of looks over, leans over, and looks at him like, what are you doing? Stop being an idiot. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you don't just say these magic words and then you get this power. That's not how it works. So there's no uh, Old Testament prophetic succession. This mantle doesn't go from Elijah to Elisha to whoever, to whoever, to whoever, all throughout the Old Testament. It doesn't work like that. And the passing of the mantle was exceptional in the Old Testament. And there's no Old Testament prophetic succession, just as there is no New Testament apostolic succession. This idea that the power of the apostles is passed to their uh, converts and then is passed to their converts. Or, you know, as the Roman Catholic Church puts it, the power of Peter is passed on to the Pope and then to the next Pope and the next Pope, all the way down to Pope Francis. There's none of that. That's not biblical. That's not biblical in the Old Testament, and that's not biblical in the New Testament. All right? And uh, the, the passing of the mantle was extremely exceptional in the Old Testament and it uh, is extremely exceptional in the New Testament, uh, and we'll get into that next week. And uh, let me just say, it most certainly didn't happen with any pastor you know. <laughs> uh, what happened here was exceptional, and it was very rare. And you're kidding yourself if you think that it happens when some godly pastor, pastor passes away, and the next pastor in line has to assume their responsibilities. There is no mantle that's being passed around, and you need to get that, all right? Or else you're going to fall into the trap of pastor worship, and there really is a lot of that that goes on, even in Bible-believing circles. All right, now as we press, progress through this Bible study, I want you to notice a pattern that's going to be starting to develop as we go. There was something special about the power of God that Elijah had, and many prophets in the Old Testament had the Spirit of God on them, but the power that God gave to some of the prophets is not the same power that he gave to some of the other prophets. The, the prophets in the Old Testament that had exceptional power, okay, a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament had power and could do different things, but the ones that had exceptional power in the Bible were Moses and Elijah. Nobody in the Old Testament even comes close to these guys. Moses and Elijah. All right, there are a lot of prophets who ac accurately predicted the future, and there were a lot of prophets who did some miracles, and there were a lot of prophets who were involved in delivering the Jewish people from their enemies. But these two men, Moses and Elijah, are singled out as exceptionally remarkable prophets, and it's evidenced by the fact that, number one, they were both taken bodily into heaven when they died. And that's interesting. You don't find that very often in the Bible. But these two men, Moses and Elijah, were both taken bodily into heaven. I should say not when they died, because Elijah didn't die. Uh, but they were both taken bodily into heaven. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, we're simply told that Moses was buried and no one, nobody knew where his sepulcher was. But way later on in the book of Jude, we're given the rest of the story as to the reason why nobody could find Moses' body. And the reason is, is because uh, his body was taken by a body snatcher. <laughs> Jude uh, 9, it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. 
durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now that's a very strange verse there in your Bible. You never read about any of that in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, the, the, aim, the, the archangel Michael took the body of, Ho, of Moses to heaven, and when he was doing so, he was, it, the whole thing was being protested by Satan. <laughs> How peculiar. And the fact that their bodies were taken into heaven, Moses' body, his dead body in that instance, and Elijah, the fact that those two were taken into heaven is weird enough, but it's equally strange that their souls were taken into heaven also. Because in the Old Testament, the souls of godly men went to paradise in the heart of the earth, not heaven. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the big reasons why salvation in the Old Testament is not the same as salvation in the New Testament. They didn't even go to the same place when they died. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, you remember there's that story. Uh, Saul is about to die, and he goes and visits the witch of Endor. You know, he's trying to get a prophecy because he can't get a hold of the Lord. So he goes to this witch of Endor and uh, tries to get her to contact the dead spirit of the prophet Samuel. All right, and so when her call is connected... To the other side, she says, quote, She saw God's ascending out of the earth. 1 Samuel 28, verse 13. Remember that? When she, uh, her seance, her, her, her spell or whatever works, and she goes into an altered state of consciousness or whatever, and she says, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. And then in verse 4, is Saul says unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. But notice there that she said, An old man cometh up. Why didn't she say, An old man cometh down from heaven? Why didn't she say that? Well, it's because Samuel wasn't in heaven when he was, when he was called up. <laughs> Samuel's spirit, Samuel's soul was under the earth and came up. And uh, Samuel didn't go to heaven when he died. He went into paradise in the heart of the earth. And those souls that were down there uh, didn't go to heaven until Jesus rose from the dead and uh, 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 brought captivity captive, like it says there in Ephesians chapter 4. So when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the Father, then he took that, those captive Old Testament souls. They were redeemed, finally, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they could now be taken into heaven. So the only humans, it's just kind of interesting, the only humans that were in heaven in the Old Testament were Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, all right? And you read about Enoch there in Genesis chapter 5. All right, the second thing that's unique and remarkable about these two men in particular is that Moses and Elijah both appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Those two guys in particular, all right? And that's in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1, it says this, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias. That's the Greek to English version of Elijah. Elias, Elijah, same person. Moses and Elias talking with them. All right? So, again, you have these two guys singled out, Moses and Elijah. All right? And then in the third thing, the, th the third thing that's remarkable about these two prophets in particular is that it's prophesied that both of them would return someday. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 18, and if you look at verse 18, the Bible says, I will raise them up a prophet, God is speaking to Moses. He says, I will raise them, Israel, up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, okay? And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So God says someday there's going to be a prophet like you that's going to show up. He's going to be just like you, all right? And then in uh, Malachi chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4, now, you might already know this information, but if you have never heard this before, I'm sure this is fairly interesting. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, the Bible says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And look who just happens to show up in the verse right before that, in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet. All right, so you have Moses and Elijah. These two guys show up a lot. And I'll say more about the return of these two in the next lesson. But for now, I'll suffice it to say, it appears that Moses and Elijah are those two witnesses who appear in the end times and are killed by the Antichrist. All right, Revelation chapter 11. It looks like, the Bible doesn't specifically say it, okay? It just says there's going to be these two witnesses. But every indication in the passage is that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah returned. All right, and this is future. Revelation 11 verse 3. It says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. All right, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. All right, and that has to do with uh, prophecy back in Zechariah chapter 4. It says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. Okay, that's the same thing that Elijah did in 2 Kings chapter 1. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Verse 6, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. All right, that's the same thing that Elijah did in 1 Kings 17. All right, and uh, by the way, the Bible says that he shut heaven for three and a half years, according to James chapter 5. All right, and uh, it says that these two witnesses will have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, well, who does that sound like? Well, that's Moses, just like in Exodus chapter 7 through 13. It says they'll have power to turn water into blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. All right, so Moses and Elijah were extremely exceptional prophets who had an exceptional level of God's spirit and power on them. Now, there's one other man in the Bible that had God's spirit and God's power like they had, and uh, that person is the Lord Jesus Christ, which obviously is God manifest in the flesh. And uh, by the way, he also was bodily taken into heaven. He also obviously was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he also is prophesied to return someday. All right, so these three individuals have these, uh, like I said, there's a pattern that's starting to develop here. Now, the Bible says in John chapter 3, if you'll turn to John chapter 3, the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Speaking of Jesus Christ. All right, so Jesus Christ, God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now, what's interesting about that statement there is that it, con it stands in contrast to the condition of the Christians who follow Jesus. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In the context of spiritual gifts or uh, spiritual powers, if you will, you know, call it what you will, but spiritual gifts, abilities that are uh, granted by the power of the Spirit of God. Um, in that context, Paul says that of us Christians, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace okay, or a gift that's to be used for the benefit of others. That's what that grace means. It's, it's a gift. It's, it's an ability. It's, it's something from the Spirit of God, a grace, a, a gift that's to be used for others, not for the benefit of ourselves. All right, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, every Christian, every single Christian, including you, if you're watching, Every single Christian has a spiritual gift, every single one. And Jesus decides what that specific gift is for each individual. And Jesus decides what measure or to what extent you have that gift. And the measure of your gift or your ability allotted to you by the Holy Ghost is apparently directly related to the measure of your faith. And if you look at Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. 
The Bible says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, Paul's saying, the gift that was given to me by the Holy Spirit, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure, the measure of faith. All right, so grace and faith, as we know, go together, and it's no different with the usage of your spiritual gifts. You know, faith is what pleases God. So God, by His grace, has given you a grace, a gift, that can be utilized on the, for the benefit of other people, but the way you utilize that spiritual gift that you have is going to be by faith. All right? So it's by faith. So anyway, the point that I'm getting at is that under normal circumstances... God's servants, whether it be in the Old Testament or the New Testament, are given various gifts and abilities, but those gifts and abilities and powers are always doled out according to various measures. All right? Every Christian in the New Testament, you, Jesus had the, had the Spirit of God given to him without measure, meaning he had all the gifts, he had all the powers. He, it was limitless, exceptional power. There was no measure associated with it. That's not the case for me and you, and that's not the case for most of the prophets in the Old Testament. It was limited, all right? Jesus was an exception. His ability was unlimited, all right? And I suspect that the same can be said of Moses and Elijah. They were exceptions, and I think that it could be said of them that their abilities and powers were also limitless, unlimited. Now, Bear in mind, you say, well, I don't know if Moses and Elijah had unlimited power. I mean, certainly Jesus had unlimited power, right? But what about Moses and Elijah? Did they have unlimited power? I don't know about that. Well, bear in mind that just because someone's power is unlimited doesn't mean that the utilization of that power is unrestrained. Jesus had unlimited power, certainly. But as always, the Holy Spirit, the source of that power works in conjunction with the will of the Father, okay, all right? So, you, so they don't just go around doing, you know, just uh, willy-nilly deciding what they want to do, you know, and, and without any regard for what the will of God is. It doesn't work that way. For example, Jesus didn't run around in his earthly ministry snapping his fingers and making everybody a millionaire, okay? Certainly, Jesus could have done that. I don't have any doubt that Jesus had the power and ability, if you will, to snap his fingers and make everyone a, mil a millionaire. I mean, he could have done the Oprah Winfrey thing and said to the crowds, you know, a house for you and a house for you and a house for you and a house for you. And I have no doubt that he had the power, if you will, to be able to do that. I mean, he is the creator after all, you know, and he could have snapped his fingers and given every one of those people and the multitudes a house, but he didn't do that. Why? <laughs> because that wasn't the will of God at the time. If that had been the will of God, then it, but absolutely he could have done it, no problem. But that was not the will of God at that time. Now let me just say that will be the will of God someday up in heaven for you, <laughs> right? When you get to heaven, guess what? A mansion for you, a mansion for you, a mansion for you, a mansion for you. <laughs> John 14, right? Praise the Lord. So uh, God usually limits the spiritual power that he gives to, to his servants, but in some rare instances, he evidently chooses to give some individuals limitless power, but he has only entrusted limitless power to Jesus and Moses and Elijah, evidently. And here is why I think Moses and Elijah had limitless power. Um, it's prophesied that a prophet like unto Moses would come to Israel someday, and at first... The nation of Israel wondered if John the Baptist was that fulfillment. If you look at John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1, I'm making really good time today. John chapter 1, in verse 21, it says, And they asked him, John the Baptist, What then? Art thou Elias? You know, art, art thou Elijah? Right? They're aware of the prophecies that Moses and Elijah are supposed to return. All right, so they said, Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. All right? They said, art thou that prophet? Well, what prophet are they referring to? They're referring to the prophet that was prophesied to come who would be like unto Moses. So it's saying, are you Elijah? No. Are you Moses? No. <laughs> and uh, they asked him, verse 25, and said unto him, 
Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, nor that prophet? You see that in John 1, 25? Christ, Elijah, that prophet, Moses. Those three showing up again. All right? So John the Baptist was not that prophet. But guess what? Jesus Christ fits that description to a T. Remember Deuteronomy 18.18? 18? God said, I will raise them up a prophet among their brethren, like unto thee, like unto Moses. Now look at what, now what God said in Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is this. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And this matches Jesus Christ exactly. And when Jesus miraculously feeds the multitude with bread, the Bible says in John 6, 14, Then those men which had seen the miracles that Jesus did said of a truth, uh, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Right? So when he fed the multitudes with bread, they're saying, this is that prophet that's supposed to be like unto Moses. Jesus is the one that's that prophet. All right? And also, if you look at Acts chapter 3, you say, well, what are you doing here? What I'm doing here is I'm establishing the fact that uh, in the Old Testament you had Moses... And uh, in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that there would be a prophet like unto Moses that would return. And Jesus Christ is that prophet that was like unto Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. And if you look at Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter also indicated that Jesus was the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. Acts 3 verse 22 for Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Okay? So he's directing the people's attention, his audience's attention to this prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And then in verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Verse 24, Yea, and all the prophets... From Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. The days that Peter was living in. The days that had just surrounded everything that had gone on. The ministry of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection. All right? And then in verse 26 he says, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So he's referring to this prophecy of this one that's going to come like unto Moses. And basically he's directing the people's attention to Jesus Christ. You see that? So the one who, who is prophesied to come like unto Moses, that was Jesus. All right? He fulfilled that. Or at least he, he, uh, he was in that position at that time. And like I said, I'll say more about that next week. Now, again, here's a little bit, here's where things get a little bit complicated. And, and I'll explain it more in the next lesson. But... Had the Jews received Jesus Christ, then Jesus would have been the complete fulfillment of the return of Moses, and John the Baptist would have been the fulfillment of the return of Elijah. And uh, like I said, that's a study for next time, but here's what I'm going to draw your attention to today. Jesus was a prophet like unto Moses. In other words, Jesus was like Moses. And that means that if Jesus was like Moses, then in some way, G Moses was like Jesus. You see that? They're similar. Okay? And if the power or the gifts of the Spirit was given without measure to, to Jesus, and if Jesus and Moses were similar, then a case could be made that the power of the Spirit was also given without measure unto Moses. You see that? So what I'm getting at is, we know that the Spirit, the power of God, was given without measure to Jesus. But Jesus is like Moses. So therefore, it could maybe be surmised that the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, was given without measure unto Moses also. Alright? Look at that verse again there in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Alright? For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. 
So we have that statement as we've looked at, but look at what surrounds that statement. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. The one that God sent is Jesus there, and he speaketh the words of God. That's Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where it said, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. All right, so there in John chapter 3, verse 34, even though you, you're not, you wouldn't necessarily catch it unless you studied and compared Scripture with Scripture, essentially what John is saying there is Jesus is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. All right, and then in John 3, verse 33, the verse that precedes that, it says this, He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. And then in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You say, what's that? That's Deuteronomy 18, 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. All right, so Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19 is directly connected to John 3, verse 33 through 36. Jesus spoke the words of God, and if the people didn't receive Jesus' words, God the Father would require it of them. His wrath would abide upon them. All right? So John 3 is drawing a correlation between Jesus and Moses. And what I'm suggesting is that Jesus was given the Spirit without measure because Moses was given the Spirit without measure. And Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. There's no, there's no prophet in the Old Testament that had the power like Moses had. I mean, it was, for all practical purposes, limitless, unlimited power. And Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses, and that's why it says the Spirit also is given without measure unto him. He had that limitless power like Moses had. That's what I'm trying to point out here. And I'll show you one more verse that backs that up, and uh, then we'll wrap up for today. Revelation 11. And this, here's these two witnesses again that by all indications are Moses and Elijah. And look at what it says in verse 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues. Now look what it says. As often as they will. Well, that's interesting. They can, whatever they will, it's done. Okay. So that means these two men, these two witnesses, have God-like power. You know who can will something and it be done? That's God. <laughs> but the Bible says that these two witnesses says they can smite the earth with any plague they want, whenever they want, as often as they will. That's God-like power. All they have to do is say the word and it happens. They speak, and it is done. God can do that. That's God's power. But these two guys have that. Moses and Elijah have that. The thing is, though, like Jesus, their doings are going to be in accordance with the Father's will. All right? So as often as they will, their will and God's will are going to be perfectly aligned. And the fact that these two witnesses... Uh, rise from the dead and ascend like they do, as it says in verse 11, indicates that they lived sinless lives while they were around. Which also lends to the idea that these two witnesses are more than just some average humans. There's something special about these two guys. And by all indication, these are Moses and Elijah. They're already uh, you know, glorified, if you will, uh, and they come back and they're sinless. And that's why when they die, they raise from the dead and they ascend. No human being on the earth can do that, <laughs> right? Until you get your new body from Jesus at the rapture, all right? But anyway, limitless, measureless power from God, as evidenced by the ability to speak anything and it be done. Jesus had that, and he still has that, for that matter. Moses evidently had that, according to John chapter 3 and the correlation between the measureless power of the Spirit and Jesus being like unto Moses. So Jesus had that, that limitless, unlimited power, certainly. Moses had that unlimited power, uh, evidently. And Elijah 
had that limitless power, apparently, as he is included in this trio, and, and there's a lot of similarities between these three guys, three, three individuals, all right? And so, I say that respectfully, obviously, well, Jesus is the Lord, all right? So, uh, these, and the two witnesses there in Revelation 11, who are most likely Moses and Elijah, also have limitless, exceptional, uh, unlimited power, all right? It's all, all of it is the same spirit and power of God on these three. So the spirit and power of Elijah is the spirit and power of God that was on Elijah, and it was on Moses, and it was on Jesus Christ. It's interesting to think about. I hope this lesson has uh, stimulated your mind and has whet your appetite for more in-depth teaching of the Word of God, which we will continue with next week. God bless you.